Yeah, the unmute. Can you hear me? Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Barnabas teaching on the Apostle John. Giving honor to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and honoring the angel of this house in the person of Bishop Jacqueline E. McCullough. Honoring also our overseers, Robin Edwards and Trish McLeod, acknowledging our executive pastors, Brian and Nadine McKenzie, all Beth Rafa and Alliance leaders, and all of you God's people, including those on social media. I say welcome. Tonight's lesson, we will be uh, teaching on the life uh, lessons and applications of what the Apostle John teaches us. But before we begin our class, let's watch a brief video as a form of review of last week's lesson. John the Apostle. Now there's a few things that you may not have known about John's early life. Like many of us, when John was a boy, he enjoyed fishing. But the difference being that John's dad actually had his own fishing business, and scholars tend to think that they were doing pretty well for themselves because John's dad had his own boat, he had his own hired servants, and John was helping him out and all that. Like father, like son. Now John's personality. John had a brother named James and Jesus actually nicknamed them both Bonerges, meaning sons of thunder. So imagine thunder and thunder having babies. Those babies would be John and James. I know, that's pretty awesome. So example number one of Bonerges in action. There was a guy that was casting out demons in Jesus' name, and John, in his passion and zeal, told him to stop. Jesus rebuked John. Example number two. John and James, along with their mom, walked up to Jesus and asked if they could be the most powerful men in his coming kingdom. Could they be at his right and left hand? And Jesus rebuked them here as well. An example number three, and my favorite by far, Jesus along with his disciples walked to a city called Samaria and they were rejected by them there. So John and James asked Jesus if he could call down fire on that city to destroy it for having rejected their message and their lodging there. Jesus rebuked them here as well. So John was passionate. He had faith. But he was still working on his compassion. Like many of us, John kept certain people to him closer than others, what one might call a best friend. And this is a guy we both know and we love, Peter. It was John that was with Peter and Jesus at the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. It was John, Peter, and James that were called the three pillars of the early church. It was Peter and John that followed Christ at his crucifixion. It was John and Peter that ran to the tomb when they found out it was empty for Mary. And it was John and Peter that, in the book of Acts, preached throughout all of Samaria the gospel of the kingdom. Now one of the most important parts of John's story is his relationship to Jesus, and that's that he was especially close. It was John that was one of the three with Jesus when he raised a girl from the dead. When he saw Moses and Elijah, the transfiguration, and when Jesus cried tears of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was John and Peter that were sent to prepare the Last Supper right before Jesus' crucifixion. And John was actually leaning on Jesus at that supper. On the way to the crucifixion, it was to John that Jesus entrusted his own mother, who we know as Mary, on his way to his death. So John's early life 
He was a fisherman along with his father. His personality, he was passionate, he had faith, was working on his compassion. One of his best friends was Peter. And John was especially close to Jesus. So there you have it. That's John the Apostle. Amen. Wasn't that an awesome review? <laughs> we could have played that uh, video last week and we wouldn't have taught the lesson. But anyway, tonight's lesson, thank you so much, media. Um, tonight's lesson, we will be focusing on the practical piece of our teaching about John the Apostle. Because it's always good to have knowledge and it leads to understanding, but then it's even better to internalize and put into practice what we're learning, right? What am I walking away with and how to apply it to our daily lives? So before continuing, I would like to make a correction to last week's lesson. When we were, when I was discussing John's weaknesses last week, I mentioned that Jesus was impetuous and had an appetite for, for violence. But as a correction, we were mentioning that about John and not about Jesus. As we know that Jesus is the personification of peace, temperance, and love. So with that in mind, um, and that out of the way, let's dive into this week's life lessons and application. So one thing that we see throughout John's writing are discussions about a good shepherd, right? Here begins the reading of God's holy word of John 10, 26 to 28. But ye believe not because you are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So far the scripture. So this scripture is all about the calling and who did the calling, right? The part where the scripture says, um, my sheep hear my voice is the calling or the being chosen. The following me is answering the call and obediently following Jesus, right? Jesus as the good shepherd is choosing and calling and we as his sheep are responding. It also means that the kingdom is an exclusive club to the chosen. It is only for the ones that hear his voice. Sorry, not sorry world. Upon answering the call, Jesus gives us the assurance that we cannot be lost or lose our salvation, right? As we um, are part of Jesus's flock and he is a good shepherd and that will not allow his chosen people to perish, right? It is an assurance to believers. <laughs> then let's look at another scripture where John mentioned the sheep, uh, you know, the shepherd and the sheep. Uh, here begins the reading of God's holy word coming from John uh, chapter 21, verses 15 to 17. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lambs. Now, I'm not going into uh, um, verses 16 and 17. You could do that in your meditation. It's just a repetition two more times of Jesus asking Simon Peter, do you love me? And telling him, then feed my sheep. So Jesus asked Peter the same question three times between verses 15 to 17. Lovest thou me more than these? And three times Peter said, yes, Lord, I love thee. Jesus asked him three times, not because Peter did not hear the question, but because of Peter's answer. Jesus knew Peter was not understanding or fully grasping what it was that was being asked. So let me break it down. This is what Jesus was asking when he said, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than mother, father, money, comfort, children, wives, jobs, health, strength, 
Yes, health and strength also, because on our deathbed, what name will we be delivering our souls to? Hard to hear, but must be talked about as our lives will reflect what we believe in on our deathbed, right? Do you love me more than that car that you pride yourself on having? Do you love me more than your pride and flesh? Or when you don't have any of these things, will you deny me? Because saints, you know, we do deny him on a regular. He also told him, then if you love me as you say more than these things, take care of my sheep. Love my sheep as you love me. Love my work for the kingdom and considering continuing the work by adding, you know, your local church as a beneficiary and leaving something to continue that work should anything unforeseen happen. Treat my sheep with kindness, dignity, and respect. Step out of your comfort zone to intentionally reach out and encourage and strengthen the new converts and brethren. Show kindness and respect to the mature Christians who have been running this race for a long time. Put something in place so you are available the next time one of the brethren needs you. Do not allow yourself to become a stumbling block for one of these sheep. Luke 17 and 2, the NIV version, uh, states, here begins the reading of God's holy word, it would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. My, my, enough said. So Christian leadership is not about position and power but about caring for Christ's flock. And if need be, laying down your life for them as a good shepherd would, along with continuing the soul-saving work Jesus began over 2,000 years ago. Amen? Now, lesson number two uh, that we learn of the life of John the Apostle is about discipleship. John gave up everything to follow Christ. I mean, remember that he wasn't a man of meager means. His family was prominent in the community and had, you know, connections with the priests. Uh, This family's name and presence carried some weight in the community. They had the uh, the financial means with which to hire help for the fishing business. Uh, uh, And Zebedee, John's father, did not just rely on his sons to help him, right? His mother, Salome, also was a follower of Christ and said to help finance the church. When John was called, he dropped his nets, left his boat, left everything behind and followed Jesus. He was also young and probably had already made plans, right, of what he was going to do uh, after he finished his job that day, let alone the rest of his life. His his life had already aligned somewhat. He had given and put thought into it. Yet he gave up everything to follow Christ. What does this say? That there is not one aspect of our lives that is untouched by being a disciple. So discipleship cannot be compartmentalized, right? Uh, To I'm this type of disciple when when at the job or out of the church, and then another type of disciple when I'm back at the church. No, discipleship touches every area, and every area has to, through the sanctification process, be aligned with the word of God. One example of this is that John was a disciple of Christ as opposed to being a member of the body of Christ or of his local church, right? John 19, 25 to 27, here begins the reading of God's holy word, says, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, right? We know that's John standing nearby. He said to her, his mother, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, to John, here is your mother. So far, the scriptures, right? So near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, right? And his mother's sister, uh, Mary. And, and 
in in a, in the batting of an eye, a young man in his early twenties all of a sudden now has to has has been charged with the care of an elderly woman. That wasn't necessarily, you know, part, wasn't part of his immediate family. But all of a sudden, okay, all those plans you had, what you were going to do later on today, what you were going to do next year that you had already written it down, well, guess what? Things just switched up a little bit. These are the times when, as disciples of Christ, it, it kind of separates us from being disciples or being members. These are the type of things, you know, as we prepare for uh, anything, are we prepared for anything discipleship brings us? If there is the possibility that the Lord will use us to be a blessing to someone else, are we getting to know that someone else in our church, even before the Lord asks? There's a big difference between assisting someone because you have been asked to or have to then to do it from the heart because you have relationship with that person, right? Are you building strong bonds with the brethren? It's also the little things that we have to be mindful of. If called by Bishop, are our tanks at least half filled with gas so we don't have to go stumbling? Lord of mercy, you know I stumble in this regard right here. This taught me first. Are our finances and spending under control to finance God's house? Or are we in way over our heads that we have nothing left? Do we allow the vicissitudes of life to take over in such a way where our relationship and children become our idols rather than continue to be God-centered? These are just some questions that I ask myself as I prepare for this lesson, saints, you know? Discipleship costs. And the price is reigning in the flesh daily, praying, fasting, evangelizing, and putting the matters of the kingdom above our own flesh and pride. Amen. Lesson number three. John was first in recognizing Jesus. Uh, let's read John 21 and 7. Here begins the reading of God. Uh, of God's holy word. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. So far the scripture. So, <laughs> excuse me. After Jesus's resurrection, right? We see in John 20, the chapter before this one, before the scripture, verses 13 to 21, that Jesus first showed himself to Mary Magdalene. Mary, thought that it was the gardener standing outside the tomb and told him, they have taken my Lord away and I don't know where they have put him. Then verse 13, when Jesus said in verse, four, uh, you know, uh, Jesus said in verse 14, Mary, she turned around and realized that it was the risen Christ. Then Jesus appears to his disciples when they were together and said, peace be with you. That's verse 21. These verses are all in the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, just leading up to this one. I'm just giving you a little, you know, uh, uh, background. Then Jesus appears to Thomas and afterwards in John 21, here we go. Starting with verse one, we see that Jesus appeared to his disciples, including John by the Sea of Tiberias. So Jesus basically shows up in the 21st chapter of the Gospel of John and yells, friends, have you any meat? In other words, have you any fish, right? And the disciples responded with a no. Jesus then tells them to throw the net on the right side of the boat and they will find some. Verse seven of chapter 21 starts with, here uh, begins the reading of God's holy word. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. So they loaded up the fish and had breakfast with Jesus, but none dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Well, although scripture does not answer why the disciples didn't recognize Jesus, many theologians have speculated thus. They didn't fully understand that Jesus would rise again and were not looking for Jesus to be resurrected. They didn't understand the whole resurrection thing. 
they had seen him being transfigured, but resurrection may have been beyond them um, at, at this point when, you know, they knew they had just put Jesus's body away. Like we just buried him and he's standing in front of us. All right. Mark nine verses 31 to 32 states that Jesus taught his disciples and said unto them, the son of man is delivered into the hands of men. I'm sorry, here begins the reading of God's holy word. The son of man is delivered into the hands of men and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. So far the scripture, right? You know, some people, you know, require more information for understanding some require detailed instructions of how something is going to happen or take place, right? Mary Magdalene thought he was the gardener in John 20, 15. There were several instances in the Bible where Jesus did not make himself fully known and those around him did not recognize him, right? Jesus sometimes veiled himself. We'll never know. But one thing we can be sure of, one thing that we can be confident of, and one thing we can know with certainty, just as John did and wrote about, is that Jesus rose. Glory to God. Yes, he did. There were enough witnesses in the 40 days after Jesus' resurrection to remove all doubt of whether he rose or whether Jesus is alive. Those witnesses removed all doubt as to whether Jesus really walked among us, was crucified, and rose again right? Godquestions.com put it this way. What we can know for certain is that it was Jesus himself who appeared to them because of the testimony of those who saw the resurrected Christ. Yes, there were plenty of witnesses, saints. In addition, there was the witness of the remarkable change, if you will, that took place in the lives of the disciples. So the next time, remember, these are life lessons now. The next time the enemy tries to discourage you by planting in your mind that Jesus is dead and cannot help you, or, or better yet, did all of this really happen? Because, I mean, it was over 2,000 years ago. Come on. That doesn't pertain to us today. With confidence, you can state that the devil is a liar because Jesus lives. Glory to the living God. I know what I know by the grace of God and do not have to change what I know as truth to conform to your lie. Don't hang your head. Don't break into a sweat. Don't stutter, but boldly proclaim the truth. And don't apologize or feel that you have to step in uh, and add your two cents into any matter con concerning Jesus. Just boldly and confidently as John proclaimed that what the truth saith that the Lord in his word and God will do the rest. Just you do your part and say what thus saith the Lord in his word and the Lord will do the rest. Bishop puts it this way. Um, but the Bible says, you know, every time I hear her say that, it's like, but the Bible says, put the word on it, right? So yes, pray for an increased confidence in Christ and his work. And the last, um, the last uh, slide we're going to talk about before we go into summary is Jesus is more than, right? So in our previous lesson, we learned that John was the apostle whom Jesus loved. We learned that he was at the center uh, uh, of the first, you know, Jesus's first miracle with the marriage in Cana, right? And witnessed many others. He was at Jesus's transfiguration where he saw Jesus in all his divine glory. And he was at Jesus's crucifixion. One would think that seeing all these signs and wonders, John would truly have an understanding of who Jesus was. I mean, he walked and talked with Jesus day in and day out. However, 
while on the Isle of Patmos, John received, I don't know if you guys remember from last, uh, last week's lesson, the Emperor Domitian didn't know what to do with him after he, he safely took him out of the vat of oil. So he had him exiled to this Isle of, Pat, of Patmos, which was a mining um, isle. And um, he receives, John received a revelation, right? And even though he had been part of Jesus's inner inner circle and he saw miracles after miracles john was was not prepared for this revelation right so here begins the reading of god's holy word of revelations one and one the revelation of jesus christ wait a minute let me move this out of the way which god gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Chapter one states, I am, um, give me one second, I am so sorry. Then verse 18 states, I had to chop it up because it was so big. So verse 18 of Revelation chapter one states, I am he that liveth, and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death, so far the scripture. So when this revelation came, the Bible says that John fell at Jesus's feet as though dead, and Jesus had to place his hand on him and tell him, do not be afraid. Now, the question I ask myself is why would Jesus have to do that to John whom he loved? They had relationship, they knew, they knew each other. John wasn't afraid of him. Um, he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, you know, Jesus was his friend. Why was John so afraid of Jesus whom he loved back? Here we go. Because despite all that John knew about Jesus, he was just not prepared to see him as he truly is, the glorified Christ. And it still caught him off guard. I can only imagine. And guess what? If believers persevere, we will see Jesus as he truly is. And we will be like him, right? First Corinthians 13 and 12 tells us that now I know in part, then I shall know fully even as I am fully known. Why am I saying all this? Because John pursued Jesus. He left everything for Jesus and John did not stop following and doing Jesus's work until death. He was used by Jesus to perform miracles and do wondrous works, right? Literary works and changed lives. The only way we can get to know Jesus as John did is to also pursue and persevere, read his word, be obedient, be like sheep, right? That allow themselves to be shepherded because it's part of their DNA to follow. Saints, I, you know, I know it's not in our DNA to follow, but pray fast and, they, uh, and then pray and fast some more for God to give us the desire to follow and be obedient, for him to give us the strength, the desire, because there's nothing in this flesh that wants it, right? This isn't easy, nor anything we can do on our own strength. There is nothing in us that wants God. We were once active enemies of God, but he drew us and thought, and through the sanctification process, we are being changed and made new daily but it is by grace and by God's strength that we can run this race. So these are facets. There are facets to knowing Jesus that, that we never knew existed and we'll never know until we are glorified and are like him. There's so much about Jesus that we will not know until we are glorified. There is also more to learn and walking with Jesus promises us a lifetime of new breakthroughs and new revelations because Jesus is more than anything we could ever think, right? Jesus is more than. So 
just as a form of summary of tonight's lesson, before I open it up for, um, for reflections or for your comments, let's summarize the lesson with the day-to-day -day points to meditate on. Number one, we learn Christian leadership from the Apostle John, and it looks like this. If you love Jesus, feed his sheep. Feeding Jesus' sheep means provide sound doctrine, show love, compassion, kindness to each other. Be readily available to assist in any capacity. No act on our part is too small for Jesus. If all we know how to do is pray, then pray for the brethren and new converts. For the prayers of the righteous avail of, avail of much, right? Do nothing that would make a saint stumble, meaning checking our lifestyles. Through the writing of John, we saw that he was determined, had zeal, was courageous for the cause of Christ. As leaders, we must be also, right? That's number one. Number two, John also teaches us to be confident. Be confident in the God you serve. Be confident in that Jesus was in heaven, became incarnate, was crucified and buried, but rose on the third day. Be confident that Jesus is not dead, but alive and ready, willing and able to help with whatever we bring to him. So rather than hold back prayers that we think Jesus can not help with, how about letting them go and putting them on the altar and ask Jesus to show us why we are hesitant. But the bottom line is that we love him and want to follow him to be used by him, right? He understands our ignorance at this time. We can't fully know him right now until he is fully uh, unveiled, right? But lay those idols at his feet and see Jesus work miracle in your, miracles in your lives, right? Also know that you plus Jesus will always equal victory. And you cannot be plucked out of his, you know, his hand once, you, once you've been chosen and, and once you've answered the call. And finally, number three, Jesus is more than. Do not put Jesus in your limited box as you are holding your own blessings back. Do not run with the thoughts and interpretations that we have of who Jesus is and what he can do as they are all flawed. Let go of the reins and let Jesus take over. Then he will start showing you miracle upon miracle and take you from glory to glory for his name's sake, because his name is in the midst. He chose you. And it's right there in scripture of what God will do for his name. What will he do? Second Chronicles 7, 14 verses uh, seven, uh, second Chronicles chapter seven, verses 14 to 16 reads, here begins the reading of God's holy word. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their, heal their land, right? That's a promise from God. Psalm 103 verses two to five. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits. Who gives all your sins and heal? Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion? Who satisfies your desire with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles? That's a promise from God. And one more scripture because this is getting so good. This is getting juicy. Hold on. Psalm. 91 verses 15 to 16, he will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Thank you, Lord. See, another promise from God that while you are yet speaking, God hears and will answer your call. Do not limit God or even try to do more than he could because you can't be God giving. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. 
To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen, saints. Now, I would love, that's, uh, that's pretty much our lesson. I would love to hear your comments at this time. Does anybody have any comments? Any reflections? Reverend Jackie, thank you. Can you hear me? Um, I thank you so much for this lesson, Missionary Carmen. Um, and I love the whole thing. Um, one of the things that you said that really stood out for me, um, you talked about um, you cannot compartmentalize being a disciple, right? And I agree with that um, because we don't know what our tasks are going to be when we're disciples of Christ, right? That's the whole thing about just, you know, emulating what Christ did or learning about what the disciples were, what was expected from the disciples. When Jesus said, you know, when he said, here's your, your mother and son, here's your mother and, and mother, here's your son. That's taking on a whole nother responsibility. But what I look at, I look at putting your, 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 your stuff in order. Like if you're about to leave here and you're making plans, not only financially, but for your mother, for your children, and you leave people and you leave your finances in capable hands. Like you mentioned something about to the church, you know, um, your benefits to the church or your whatever to the church, you know, leave it an inheritance, it's, it's sort of speak. But that's an awesome responsibility for somebody to say, I'm leaving here, take care of my mother, right? But it's also it speak volumes to the person who takes on the assignment with love. You know, because not every, you said something, wait a minute, I had a five-year plan. Like I was planning to go to Japan. I was planning to go to Paris. I was planning to go to Africa. And now you give me to take care of your mother. That means that whatever illnesses she go through in life, I'm responsible for medical bills, all that stuff, you know, feeding her, making sure she's cared for. And Jesus knew enough about John to know that he was able to handle the assignment. And so being a disciple to me, it's not about compartmentalizing it. You know, um, I could be a disciple here, but over here, this is my life. I'm going to do me on this end. But when I get to church, I'll be a good disciple. Is a disciple when I wake up in the morning. I'm a disciple when I go to sleep at night. I'm a disciple at the supermarket in the laundromat. I am a disciple and I should carry myself as such. So, I mean, there's so much more I can say, but that's one of the things, one of the things that stood out for me. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much for that comment. It just, it just, that whole scenario is, is just amazing to me. He did the same way when he was called by Jesus at the sea and he just dropped everything. That's the same way he reacted. So there was intimacy there. There was relationship there. They, you know, Jesus knew who he called and that sooner or later, you, you might need a little bit polishing, a little bit of cleaning up right now because you're young and, you know, your you're youth and stuff like that, you're immature, but that sooner or later, he would be available, as you said, for the assignment. Amen. Thank you so much for that comment. Anyone else? Um, anytime I think about John um, and how he's John the Beloved, I think about how what it must have been like to not just be chosen to be part of the 12, but even be also be chosen to be a part of that, you know, sort of inner circle for lack of a better phrase in terms of um, the three. And when you talked about how like his mom had asked that um, he and his brother be able to sit at his right hand um, in his throne. But Jane, I mean, John already kind of experienced being able to, to be that close, um, even more so than, than the rest of the disciples. And I always think about how, like, I want to be, you know, close to Jesus. I want to be chosen to be, you know, even closer with Jesus, but, you know, am I willing to pay the price? You know, we talk, even though John didn't die a martyr's death, it wasn't for lack of people trying, 
you know, I can't say, yeah, sign me up for being dipped in boiling hot oil. You know, I can't say that. Or to live a life being exiled on an island, you know, I can't say that, you know, that I would sign up to do that. Obviously, if if whatever the Lord calls us to, he gives us the grace to do it. But um, I just think about, you know, the price that that had to be paid, but it was for, you know, it was his assignment and it was it was to glorify it was to glorify God and to um, spread the kingdom on the earth. So thank you for the lesson. You know, that 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 um, scenario that you mentioned, I just truly appreciate because it gives me an additional assurance in who. Uh, Jesus is and who he is in our lives, because he is not a respecter of persons. He is not going to go ahead and give you the clap, clap. No, 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 no. And and the accolades and the, you know, thumbs up. You got to put in the work like anybody else. I'm not going to go ahead and make you above the other 12. Wait a minute. We're all in this together. We all have to run this race. So get out there and do what you got to do. You might be my beloved, but you still got to put the work in. <laughs> Thank you so much. Anybody else before I hand it over to? <laughs> yes. Um, so as I was listening, um, the one thing that stuck out for me was that discipleship should touch every area of your life. So as I'm listening to that, I'm evaluating myself and I've, I'm viewing myself as doing like a, not more than a self-check. It's like a litmus test that we're always talking about, right? Or the acid test. So when we look at the different areas of our life, and we cross-reference that with the scriptures and making sure that we're being discipled, we really should be able to, um, I don't want to say diagnose ourselves, but, you know, do a spiritual check-in. That's what I'm looking for, right? Do a spiritual check-in to see where we're at and where we're not yielding to the spirit, where we're not listening for his voice. So um, I thank you for that challenge because now it's um, a way for me to just evaluate myself spiritually and where I am today. So thank you. That um, we had a reverend, he, he passed on, Reverend uh, Tommy Noble, that one day in giving one of his sermons, and I've always remembered this, given one of his sermons, he said that as a joke to him, some of his coworkers one day spoke to another coworker and said, oh yeah, because today is Friday and Tommy Noble and us and this isn't that, we're going to go to the bar and we're going to go drinking. And the, and, and the, uh, the coworker turned around and looked at them like, who, Tommy Noble? No, I know you're a liar. <laughs> no, Tommy Noble, go with you to the bar? No. See, it's not compartmentalized. Who I am here, who I am at, the, at, at, at my job, who I am at my church doesn't change because Jesus doesn't change. Reverend Jack, uh, Jackie? Yes, thank you. Um, this is so good. But I was just thinking about when you talked about, do you love me more than these? And I'm just thinking about, you know, Jesus calling them while in the midst of fishing. That's their trade, right? That's their career. That's their trade. And Jesus is telling them, come. And they drop it all and go. And I'm just thinking about myself. Sometime when we went to school, got our degree, you know, I mean, we pride ourselves on the six-figure job, right? We get into our career. And Jesus now calls us to something we didn't go to school for, let's say. Like, you know, and all of a sudden we got to drop all. Do you love me more than these? And the these can be almost anything. You mentioned it in your teaching, you know, and I'm thinking about Pastor Brian's sermon on Sunday, you know, like you got to die really to give up some stuff. And it is like picking up your cross and following Jesus. And it's a wholehearted thing. It's, it's not something that you can vacillate over and say, give me some time, Jesus, and, and I'll get back to you. They dropped all and followed Jesus. And so um, some of them just said, let me go bury my dead. But he challenged them on that note. But I'm saying, for me, I'm evaluating myself as a disciple. It's, it feels good on a Sunday, as Pastor Brian said. But what about when Sunday is over? That sometimes it can almost seem like emotionalism, right? And you'll know if it's emotionalism, because here come Wednesday, he said. Now, are you in that same flow in the spiritual realm as you were on Sunday when the music was playing, while everybody's in church seeing you perform? I don't want to say perform, but the bottom line is for me, I have to check myself 
because what feels good in my spirit on Sunday, because Jesus said it on a Sunday, it should still be the same for me on a Monday, Tuesday, and a Wednesday, and for the rest of my life. So am I going to change? Am I going to drop all the follow Jesus? And that's where I stand with that. I'm just evaluating. Thank you. Amen. This has been a wonderful lesson. I have enjoyed teaching it. Thank you all for your participation and your comments. I would like to hand this lesson back over to Pastor Diane. Thank you. Let's put our hands together and thank God for missionary Carmen. This is her final class and boy, it went out with a bang and encouragement. You know, as, as I was listening to everybody, again, it really boils down to this, that discipleship is costly. And because Jesus brought us with his precious blood, guess what, y'all? He has the right to make demands with us. You understand? I see Mercedes, is your hand up? Are you praising the Lord? Welcome to you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, good evening. Um, my name is Mercedes. This is my first time. Welcome. For, Glad to um, have you, Mercedes. Welcome. Yes, ma'am. It's so many classes. So what classes is it mean? The transformation class or no. discipleship class? No, this what this is is our Barnabas Ministry Discipleship class. Thank you. It is it's, it's a new converts class, but it's also for those that have been walking with Jesus for a long time. Yes, ma'am. Clarity and things that, you know, you can ask your questions on this. And then right after this, we have our transformation class, right? Yes. Where yeah. we're talking about contending for the faith. So that's a different class than this one. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I'll be looking forward to more classes and everything. And then I'll be visiting on next for Resurrection Sunday as well. So I'm excited. Okay. Wonderful. That. Wonderful. Yes, We're yes. glad to have you and we'll be glad to see you. So look at these faces and introduce yourself to us. <laughs> so look at, check out these faces. Hi, Kayla. Yes, Hi, Carmen. And we Hi, see you. Hi, <laughs> All right. So again, we thank God for Missionary Carmen. It was a wonderful lesson. But again, as we're looking and doing that um, reflection, you know, we're in the season of Lent. We're getting ready to experience Jesus and his passion. We have to reflect on our Savior and, and, the, and the great, I, 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 great is such a little word. The awesome, the, the I don't even know what's beyond awesome, Wait, whatever. You know, the sacrifice that he made for us, our only redeemer and savior, there will never be another that will be able to pay that ransom price. My gosh. And so that's something to reflect upon even in our daily sanctification. Yes, it's going to cost us and we have to sacrifice. And when he asks us to make the shift and lay down that price, that price and chiefest joy, Will we be able to do it? We may resist at first, but in the end, if we love him more than these, then guess what? We're going to do it. Amen. So be encouraged. Be, in, be encouraged. Be encouraged. Again, thank you for joining us on YouTube. We won't be back here on next Wednesday because of our Passion Week services, but you can join us uh, by asking for the fellowship link. Our services will begin Sunday night at 630, Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. We'll have prayer at seven. We welcome you if you would like to join us. And again, we'll be back again in April with a new teacher, with a new disciple of Christ. And we pray that you would invite a friend and join us. Thank God.